And it looks like we're going live. I was a little worried, as I always. I'm always afraid that something will happen. I'll have to switch to my phone again. But it looks like this morning so far so good. Um, give a moment for some folks to join in. Hopefully we'll have some folks. It is a cool, crisp, sunny morning in September. I like it. It's a nice breeze outside. It's cold, or I should say colder. If you're fond of the Almanac, it's my understanding that according to the Almanac, we're going to have a rough winter. Maybe a little more snow than usual, which that too would be fine. Uh, today, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn there. It is another section of Revelation which is rather gruesome as we get into the, the idea of destruction. This goes along with chapter 7 where we talked about the trumpets uh, that will be sounding. And there's also a little section here about the coming woes. Uh, all these John experienced and saw and wrote about. Um, I also wanted to mention something this morning. I don't usually do this as far as giving people instructions on what to read. But um, I was looking at this. There's a mention of scripture. And I thought, well, what Bible do you use? Uh, whether it be King James Version, New King James, NIV, RSV, uh, ESV. There's, there's so many good Bibles out there. Uh, there's a lot of study Bibles, and I just wanted to mention the two study Bibles that I like that I use more than some of the others. Some of them, I mean, we've got everything in Schofield, which a lot of people like Schofield. Then there's the color-corded Rainbow Bible, which makes it easier to follow. This Bible right here is a King James Version, but it's a Hebrew-Greek Bible. And what it means is that you don't have the Hebrew or Greek words in here, but you have the words that <clears throat> sometimes are confusing that are sort of parsed out from the Greek and Hebrew. The Old Testament is written primarily in Hebrew in our Bibles or translated from Hebrew and New Testament Greek. But what a lot of people may not realize is that the Hebrew of the Old Testament was first translated into Greek and we had what was known as Septuagint. Uh, and so because of the Septuagint, the Hebrew language all but died out. And so it was resurrected by the Jewish Masoretic people who did what's known as the Masoretic text around the 8th century. Uh, and with that, they, I think they brought back the Hebrew pretty accurately. It's, uh, they, used a, they changed the alphabet a little bit. It's the same alphabet that's used in Israel today. Uh, but because of that, we have to realize that the Hebrew of the Old Testament is qualified, or I guess you say qualified, as a dead language. Uh, and that led a lot of people to say, well, how do we know we're reading it correctly? And that question still pops up. Um, what we have today is the Masoretic version of Hebrew. And more and more people are going back and they're making connections with ancient Hebrew. Because it seems to be a dialect that came out of early Sumerian Chaldean languages. Uh, and so there's a lot of study going on. We know a lot more today about the Hebrew language than, say, even 50 years ago. But this guy here, his name is Spiro Zodiacus. He has done one of the best studies of both Greek and Hebrew text. And he put it in his study Bible. So I use that one a lot. Uh, the other book that... I think probably is one of my favorites is this and it's oh it's backwards again but this is the new oxford annotated bible the new revised standard version with the apocrypha and that's a mouthful but what you have with this is the oxford annotated bible was the english bible at one point and it had in it the apocrypha which is 14 books that Originally, they were included in Scripture, in, uh, Latin Scripture, I should say. Jerome was the guy who first translated the Bible for the Roman Catholic Church. 
uh, around the 4th, 5th century, and he included it. And then all these other groups uh, began to include it. Even the early Protestant church included the Apocrypha, these 14 books. And they're, they're 14 books roughly with pieces of other books. Uh, and um, somewhere along the way, well, let's see, they, they got to, to Switzerland, uh, and they were in the Geneva Bible, the Zurich Bible, what later became known as the Great Bible, which went to England and became the Bible. Uh, and it was then that King James decided, well, we can't be using the Swiss Bible. And so he commissioned the King James Bible around the 16th century. And they used it. And with the Oxford Study Bible, they included the Apocrypha. But the King James uh, did not include the Apocrypha. Not because they were heretical or false, but a lot of it because they were redundant. Uh, a lot of what you read there, uh, you'll find in the Bible already, with the exception of a few folk tales like Bell and the Dragon and the Story of Susanna. They thought, well, those really aren't scripture. They're more uh, Jewish folk tales. Um, you have more about Esther in there, a whole book about Esther. But anyway, this book, the Oxford Annotated Bible, is not the ancient one or old one. This is a new version. Uh, it comes around the turn of the century where they took the King James Bible and going back through with what scholars knew, they came up with what is known as the Revised Standard Version. And this is even a, another revision called the New Revised Standard Version. They put the Apoc uh, Apocrypha in. Uh, but some people are afraid of the Apocrypha, but you shouldn't be. It's a good study source. Uh, and there, there's a lot of good stuff. A lot of what you find in Revelation, by the way, uh, references the Apocrypha. Uh, in today's lesson, as we look at Revelation 8, a lot of the scenes you see in here uh, of destruction, they, they come from the Old Testament references, but they're not exactly the same. But you'll find them like in the book of Tobit uh, in the Apocrypha. It's like John was quoting from Tobit with what he was seeing and made the connection. And we'll, we'll go through some of that in a moment. But let's turn to chapter 7. There's several things I wanted to point out. <clears throat> and some interesting things too. This starts off and it says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half of an hour. That's a dramatic beginning. Verse 2 then says, Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. And then verse 3 says, Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar, uh, and it goes on. But there's something going on here that a lot of people aren't aware of, because you just simply read it. But the uh, positioning of these verses seem to be a little off. For instance, the very first verse, talking about the silence in heaven, that probably should go down uh, right before verse 3. It fits with that. Uh, verse 2 should go down right before verse 6 because it fits with that. Uh, and people have thought, well, wait a minute. Why are these things out of place? If they are out of place, and I'm not saying they definitely are because this is a uh, one of those contentious theories. Uh, but if you if you rearrange those verses and put verse two in front of three or verse two in front of six and one in front of three, uh, it does seem to make a little more sense uh, in, in the flow and the context of events. Uh, but at the same time, if you read this, it's not going to throw you off. There's nothing theologically wrong with it. It's just putting things in a contextual flow. But some people say, oh, no, this is the way it is. But in all likelihood, if, if these verses are out of place, it's what's known as scribal error. Now, I know some people get all upset and say, the King James Version is perfect. Well, actually it wasn't. King James Version was published and then taken back and changed a couple of times. People don't know that. They say, oh, it was perfect when it came to press. No, they had to go back and fix some mistakes. Most of them scribal errors. Uh, that's the human part. The God part's fine. The message is fine. It's just that sometimes when they were copying, because remember, this was not... Uh, this was originally handwritten before the printing press came along in the 14th century 
all Bibles were handwritten, and they were passed down, and people didn't want to change things that had been passed down a certain way, so they said, well, we can't change it. But they don't realize that probably some scribes made a mistake. But anyway, this silence in heaven uh, should go before verse 3, because then you've got, then I saw the seven angels stand in the presence of God. If you, The seven trumpets were given. If you take that verse and stick it down here in front of verse 6, they tie it together. Some people say they should go between 6 and 7. I like it in front of 6. But neither here nor there. But let's talk about what's going on. First of all, what is this silence in heaven? It's a dramatic pause. Um, and again, here, it's not explained. It just says that when he opened the seventh seal, and by the way, remember, we already had the six seals, and then there was that long break, and now here's the seventh seal finally being opened. Uh, we have that there was a silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Um, it doesn't explain what it is. If you put it in front of verse 3, it sort of does. And let me do that for you. After you read for about a half an hour, jump to verse 3. It says, Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense. Now that's important. It's not just a little flicker of incense to, to make an odor. Because incense was used in the temple ceremonies. Incense was burned at the beginning of the sacrifices and then the last thing of the day when the sacrifice or anything, incense were burned. Why? Because they were burning the offerings. And what was the offering? Well, it's an offering to God. But God doesn't come down and pick it up. They send it to God through the smoke. And to make the smoke pleasant and pleasing, they would add incense to give it a, a good smell. Now, along with that, it represented... The sacrifice was literally the petition or the prayers of the people. And that's where the early Catholic Church got the idea that when you pray collectively, you lift up your prayers and you burn incense so that the prayers go up to heaven. And that's what's happening here. Uh, he was given a large amount of incense. That means there's a lot of prayers going up. And with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. Remember that group? That's the number of the, back over here in uh, chapter 7. That's the number that couldn't be numbered. There's 144,000, the 24 elders, and then there's this multitude that couldn't even be numbered. Uh, and their prayers are going up. And those prayers go up with the incense. That's why they need a lot of incense. It says, The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. So we get this worship scene. Now, we don't do this a lot. Well, we don't do it at all, hardly in the Protestant church. The Catholic church still does it, where they'll have this huge censer above the altar that's swinging back and forth so that when the prayers are offered, it goes up with incense. Uh, it's a visual symbolism that the Protestant church did away with visuals. They did away with statues. They did away with crosses. A lot of people don't realize that you, know, you go to a church, you'll see that beautiful gold cross and candles. Uh, the Protestant, the early Protestant church would not have allowed that because they said all this is idolatry. You know, because people, even today in the Catholic church, people go and they touch the statue of the Virgin. They offer prayers. They burn candles. They do all these things, which are all visual things. But it becomes a problem when you begin to take away the visual and turn it into a realistic thing where they think the statue is coming to life or the statue is a person. My criticism of the Roman Catholic Church is their iconography that happens in the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, has taken a form of worship that I think is idolatrous. Now, some people don't feel that way. Some people just go in and say, well, it's tradition. Uh, but it, then it becomes almost like a rabbit's foot, like a good luck charm. There, uh, there's a statue of Mary in Italy, and she's holding an orb, and the whole statue's in glass except for that orb. They let it come out so the people could come by and touch it and rub it for good luck and for good fortune. Um, there is a, a vial of the blood of supposedly Jesus that turns into powder, and then once a year they take it out and shake it, it turns into blood. It determines if you're going to have a good crop. Well, I mean, this is not worship. This is more pagan uh, idolatry and iconography. So we have to be careful of that. But like I said, in the Protestant church, they did away with all of this stuff. But today we brought back the cross. 
and we have uh, certain things that are just traditional within the Protestant Church. But, um, you know, people have to be careful because they carry around a cross and a cru crucifix as if it had the power of God in it. Uh, we foster that myth with movies like vampire movies where you, know, you pull the cross up and the vampire runs away. Well, that, that's a piece of wood. It's not Jesus. Anyway, I digress. But look what happens here. These prayers go up to God with this beautiful smelling incense. But then it's silent. Go back to the silent. Why is it silent? Most people, of this, most scholars that read this in the Greek get the impression that it means that while these prayers are coming to God, everything is quiet. All the people around the room, quiet. They send their prayers up, reverence to God. When we pray, we pray in reverence to God. Uh, you know, Jesus said, go to your closet and pray, meaning that we should have a quiet, private place for prayer. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people do that. You know, we go to church and we have collective prayers where everybody, you know, the pastoral prayer or the prayer for the people, things like that. I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's part of our coming together. We have collective worship, collective praise, and collective prayer. Uh, but there is a time where the individual speaks to God. That's how our relationship builds and is deepened. Uh, and so we encourage that time of prayer. I guess one of my pet peeves is a lot of times at church we have a prelude time and we'll have soft music play, but the conversation level is so loud that sometimes you can't hear the music. The prelude time, I think, should be a time for preparation, not for conversation, unless you're talking to God through prayer as you meditate and prepare your hearts for worship. But that's just me. That's my little soapbox speech for the day, so don't get mad at me. But something unusual happens here. If you look at verse 5, the angel took the incense burner, filled it with the fire of the altar, and then hurled it to the earth. There were peals of thunder and rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, this is unusual. It's like, wait a minute. He goes, he's got this incense burner that's got the prayers going up, and then he gets fire from the altar that's burning the incense, and instead of putting, you know, like, I better back up. The incense burner would have coals inside of it, and it would smoke. And then you put the incense in there, and it would smoke up and smell good. What the angel is doing now is going and getting more coals, but the coals are not coals. Now they're literally on fire. And he takes it and uses it almost like a weapon against the earth. But what this is symbolic of is the prayers of the people may be being answered. Because what were the prayers? Well, go back. Look at the people back over there under the throne. What were they praying? They were saying, oh Lord, how long? How long until we are revenged? That is an odd prayer for Christians. You think, well, you don't sit around praying that people be killed because you want revenge for being martyred. But that's sort of what it's saying. It's not, it's not a bloodthirsty prayer. It's a prayer for justice. Uh, and that's something, too, that we forget. God is coming not just in judgment, but in justice. And his wrath will be a just wrath. Uh, I won't get started on it, but this whole today, we, we seem to forget that sin is sinful and causes punishment. We want to brush away the punishment and think, well, God won't punish us. He loves us and we'll be just fine. Uh, sorry, folks, not what the Bible says. So stop writing your own Bible to make yourself feel good. The coming of the Lord's day and the day of the Lord is a terrible thing. Because it's a day when justice and judgment will be meted out to those people deserving of the punishment they receive. These martyrs were treated brutally and horribly, and they're basically saying, Lord, we never received justice on earth. We want to see justice done now. Now, that's not a bloodthirsty cry. That's simply that we want justice. We all want justice. And this is it. This hurling of the incense in the fire is marked marking the beginning of the trumpets. The thunder rumbling, the lightning, the earthquake, all these are the natural disasters. And then, if you go back and grab verse 2, where it says, Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. And jump down to verse 6. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And verse 7, the first angel. 
<clears throat> so here we go. The first angel uh, blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. Hail and fire and blood. Uh, do you remember those references from anything? Anybody got a little? I wish you could answer me. I'm sure some people are raising their hands like a kid in third grade and knows the answer. I know what you're talking about. Well, I'll just remind you. Hail, fire, and blood. The Red Sea was turned to blood, and hail fell to the earth and burnt. This is a reference to the plagues of Egypt, and you're going to notice that reference popping up in all of these. Now, was John not being original? Well, no. John wasn't reaching back in the Old Testament and pulling something forward and putting it in his vision. He was having a vision of God, and God is working the same way. Uh, I think the parallelism is on purpose because God showed Egypt and the gods of Egypt who was all-powerful. And God, in the freedom and the freeing of the people of Israel from Egypt, he poured his wrath out on a sinful nation that had hurt them, enslaved them for 430 years. You see, the parallel is that these martyrs are crying for the same justice that the people of Israel wanted, and God came in freedom. And, and Moses said, let my people go, and the people were crying, you know, you know, where's God? Well, God showed up. And when he showed up, it was frightening. He turned the Nile to blood. He rained down hail that caught fire. Well, the same thing's happening here in the Lord's day. He's going to do similar things as he rains down his justice. It says that so a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass was burned. Uh, natural disaster here, folks. Pretty obvious. But it's just a third, not total destruction. So then the second trumpet sounds. Pardon me. I have to reach over there. The second trumpet sounds, and blew his, or the second angel blew his trumpet. Something like a great mountain ablaze with fire was hurled into the sea, so a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, first we had destruction on the land. Now we have destruction on the sea. Uh, and this is not unusual because that area in the Mediterranean was plagued with problems like this. There's a good possibility that some of the uh, problems, one of the plagues of Egypt, may have been caused by a natural disaster that God created for this purpose. God is the God of nature. He created nature. And I've always told people, I said, we call it a miracle, but the, what's a miracle is the timing because God uses what he has at hand. Uh, in all likelihood, the island of Santorini was a volcanic island that exploded. And when it did, it sent tidal waves, it sent fire and ash and cloud of smoke darkening the sun. And everything you read that happened in Egypt uh, could be from a direct reaction of that. And by the way, Santorini's explosion and the curses of Egypt, if we put it on the calendar, seem to coincide. So I'm not taking anything away from God because, like I said, the miracle is that God worked it in his time frame and he did it when he wanted to do it. Um, but there's destruction of the land, destruction of the sea. Uh, and it's just a third, though. Now, the third trumpet, it sounds. Third angel blew his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the heaven. It fell on a third of the rivers and springs of water. The name of the stars, Wormwood, and the third of the waters became Wormwood. So many of the people died from the waters because they had been made bitter. A lot is made about Wormwood, but if you check the history of Israel, Wormwood was a phrase that usually meant poison or bitterness. Uh, and they would blame this thing, Wormwood, whenever they came to a, a well that was bitter. Some of this well is infected. The wormwood. Uh, there's more you could say about that, but just let me point out that this great star blazing like a torch fell from heaven. Uh, we don't. We know that stars don't fall. Okay, stars are too big to fall. So what is a falling star? It's a meteorite, and this could well have been a meteorite that crashed in and poisoned. A lot of the drinking waters and the springs, because that's what it's talking about. We have the ocean up here in verse 8. In verse 10, we're not talking about the ocean now. We're talking about springs and wells that were poisoned. And so it was wormwood. And how many people? So many of the people died from the waters because they'd been made bitter or poisoned. 
then finally we have the fourth trumpet sounded. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, a third of them were darkened, a third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. Okay, so we've gone from land to sea to springs and the water of the uh, that you drink that's in the earth to the heavens, the cosmos. But there's an interesting thing here that coincides with just what we talked about earlier. Notice it says that a third of the sun struck a third of the moon, a third of the stars, a third of the darkness. Okay, the sun wasn't hit by anything. It's still there. The moon wasn't hit. It's still there. Uh, the stars were still there, but what it says, if you look carefully, it says they were darkened. Now, people said, oh, that's an eclipse. Erase that idea for a second, because eclipses don't last a long time. A third of the day was out light, also a third of the night. What if you were to take it from this perspective and explain it this way? This destruction that we saw, the earthquake, the stuff raining down from the sky, if this was, say, the island of Santorini, the volcanic eruption which occurred around the time of the Egyptians, there would have been a, a cloud, a dust cloud, lava cloud, or whatever you want to call it, uh, that would have blocked out the sun, but not completely. I mean, it would be dark, but it not totally dark. So how would you describe that? Would you say, well, half of the sun was gone, or maybe a third of the light was darkened? And the third of the moon was dark, and then a third of the stars were. In other words, what they're telling us is that there was darkness in the sky that filtered the light. That's what they're saying here about the day of the Lord. And by the way, we've seen that on several occasions uh, when there's been great volcanic eruptions. I don't know if you remember Mount St. Helens. Uh, some of us are old enough to remember Mount St. Helens. It sent a dust cloud across the United States, and there was this haze that, you know, the, the sky looked really weird for a while. Look at California. They've got wildfires. The smoke has gone up, and now there's this weird orange glow sometimes because of the, the cloud blocking out the sun. This is destruction. I'm not trying to take away from God's miracles. Don't say, don't say well, Brooks is just explaining everything. I'm simply saying that God uses the nature he created to perform the miracles in his time. And time is more of the miracle than the event. But only God can create these things. I mean, I can't go out and cause a volcano to erupt, but God can. He controls it. So what we have now, that's the first four trumpets sounding. We got some more trumpets. But also, this verse, this chapter ends on a rather odd thing. And let me read it to you. It says, I looked and heard an eagle flying high overhead, crying out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth because of the remaining trumpet blast that the three angels are about to sound. Now, we've heard four trumpets. We, we see the destruction that people are, are facing. It's pretty horrible. And here comes this eagle. Now, remember, there's a lot of symbolism. In this story right here, the incense represents a symbolic of prayers. The trumpets, trumpets always in the Bible, they, they're uh, calling uh, an alarm. They, trumpets are used to announce the coming of royalty, and trumpets are used as a call to battle. So the trumpets here are symbolic of just what God is doing. He is calling the people to alarm them, and he's calling his servants to battle, and that servants for nature. And the plagues are being released. Plagues very similar to what happened in Egypt. And God is raining down his wrath. And the trumpets announce the coming of God's anger. So here comes an eagle. What's the eagle all about? Well, if we look, the eagle has always been a lot of mythic stuff. But for the Hebrews, the eagle is important because the eagle is the bird. It's not, you know, an eagle is basically a scavenger, but not for them. The eagle is a messenger, and that's just what he's doing here. He's, it's almost like the eagle is now in the sky, and he's crying out to say, this is just the beginning. We're halfway through, because now there are three more trumpets. Two more trumpets, uh, the fifth and sixth trumpet, be some more problems. The seventh trumpet, and I'm not going to tell you yet, but it's over there. It's sort of like separated. The seventh seal was separated from the other six. 
the seventh trumpet will be separated from the other six trumpets. Uh, and you'll see that later, I think, in chapter 9, but we'll get to that. But he also says there's the woes. And this book is divided into different things. We've had seals, we've had trumpets. There will be the woes, section of woes that come. And so all that's coming, and we, we get a build up to it. Uh, that's next week, though. I want to leave you on that. We'll start, we'll look at chapter 9 next week. Now, <clears throat> today, uh, and I am finishing almost on time. That's a miracle in itself. Uh, but I did want to pause here for a moment, as we, as I always do, and offer you an opportunity to join us in prayer. Uh, I don't have any incense, so we just have to trust our prayers to God. But um, I, I spoke with couple of people this week, and I know Davis is getting ready to go to Cabarrus Rehab this week. I thought he went last week, but he's just going t tomorrow. Um, Carol and his wife has seemed to be doing a little better. She's having dialysis. So these folks we've constantly kept in our prayers. Uh, I didn't get to speak to, but Debbie talked to uh, Mary Buckley, said Bob's doing pretty good. They thought his heart was a little out of rhythm, but it must have clicked back in, whatever that does. So I'm, I'm glad to hear Bob's doing well, and uh, let's continue to pray for him. <clears throat> well, I want to pray for the Bob Pardue also, uh, a loss in his family this week. And so keep them in prayer just specifically. The church is doing a Wednesday night service. Um, so if you're looking for a Wednesday night service, it'll be online. Uh, and there we get a, get a better update of prayer list, by the way, Wednesday night. And then today... As, of course, we have church services at our Family Life Center in First Baptist Lancaster. But we also have it online. So if you're looking for a church service and you don't have a church or maybe your church isn't doing online services and you're still a little bit worried about COVID, uh, tune in to First Baptist Church Lancaster. You can watch the sermon there. Randy Hatcher will be uh, our pastor. He preaches. And uh, they're singing online. They, they hadn't been doing that. So it's getting back to sort of normal. But I think a lot of churches are holding their services and people are coming. And I'm glad to see that. I, I, I'm one of those weird people that think we should be opening everything back up. Um, but again, I won't get into that because it sounds political. But let's take a moment to pray for those on our prayer list, those on your prayer list, and those in your heart that only you may know. Because we all have special needs in our families, our friends, uh, situations. I, you know, again... I, I watch the news a lot. You know, some people say I watch too much, but uh, it's concerning, or I should say, it's disconcerting to see what's going on in our country right now. We have elections coming up, we have all sorts of things going on. But I just pray that God's will be done in all things, and whatever happens, I believe will be in accordance with God's will. So that's my political speech for today. But let's take a moment, have a word of prayer. And again, always, I'll be here next Sunday morning at 9.30. Invite you back to share in our study of Revelations. I apologize if it's long, uh, but we only have like 30 or 40 minutes each Sunday, and Revelations is, it's deep, uh, but it's interesting. So hopefully you'll be back with us next Sunday morning at 9.30. But let's take a moment of prayer, and after this prayer, uh, I'll see you next week. You go prepare your hearts for worship in your church or online, whichever you choose to do. Pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I come this day offering you my praise and my thanks. My heart, Lord, it fills with gratitude because when the woes of the world begin to come and settle heavy, I know that it is the gratitude and the praise of God that lifts that burden, that lets me see through the smoky skies and see through the haze to realize that you are God. You are the God of love and compassion, the God who forgives and seeks and reaches out to us, and we give you thanks and praise for that, Lord. We live in a world of confusion where there's so many people that are seeking and so many people that are leading and misleading. Uh, Lord, we just pray that people would give ear to your spirit, that they can open their hearts and minds to your truth, I also pray, God, your forgiveness for our times of weakness, when we fail to do your will, when we find ourselves caught up in our own lives so much that we, we put you on hold or we put you on the back burner, so to speak. God, forgive us for those times of weakness. 
Forgive us the times where we allow our own fear and depression to, to cripple us. I pray, God, that you'd strengthen us for your service, that we can be your people and speak boldly the truth. And God, today I lifted up certain people in prayer, and my prayers go out to them again to give them strength uh, to walk and to heal their illnesses in their bodies and their hearts. And Lord, I just pray again for those on our prayer list, for everyone's listening prayer list, and for our secret needs in our heart. Lord, may our prayer always be that your will be done in all things. Now, Lord, as I often say, help us to go this week to be the people that you want us to be. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Again, thank you. We'll see you next Sunday at 9.30 as we continue in chapter 9 of the study of Revelation. Have a good day. Bye-bye.